Lord, we ask that you be in our hearts and minds, so in the reading and the speaking, we might hear what you have for us this day. For we ask it in the name of your Son. Amen. I think Vincent, our second clown that came in, I think Gail let him have my blue jeans. I want to see them back in my closet. But that was special, the children singing, you know, we always have, the music is always special every Sunday, but, uh, you know, when the children sing and we get the, the handbells and the like, it's, it's sort of like getting nuts and cherries on your Sunday, isn't it? It's, it's neat, and I appreciate the effort, it was really good. Uh, the last week we talked about the word so, um, excuse me, if. We talked about the word if and, and how powerful it was, but that it was only the second most powerful word in the English language. And today we're talking about the most powerful word in the English language, language which is the word so. So. Now the homonym may mean more to us because, you know, you take needles and thread and you take two pieces of cloth and you make one thing out of that. Or if you have something torn, uh, you know, you can fix it with needle and thread, and we're really proud of what we've done with it. And the word so just doesn't get us all excited, all that excited, does it? I mean, turn to your next door neighbor in the seat and say, so? <laughs> so? <laughs> you can hear how lifeless it is, how, um, how ambiguous it is. It really doesn't have any power, but it does when you use it as a qualifier. Things start happening. She worked not just hard, but she worked so hard. I just don't love you, I love you so much. The sermon wasn't long, it was so long. <laughs> and I got an amen back here. <laughs> what would you do? You're a public safety officer, and that means you're connected with the police department, and you're connected with the fire department, and you're connected with the emergency personnel. And you're going through your daily routine, you're polishing, cleaning equipment, and a call comes in. Someone has drowned in a, neighbor, in a, a pool, in a neighborhood pool. You and your partner jump in the unit and you take off for the address at weaving in and out of traffic, running some red lights, doing everything you can to gain time. When you jump out of your unit, you grab your emergency equipment and there's children all around screaming and crying. And you grab your equipment and you push through the children and you go around the house, and there at the pool, there's another cadre of, of children all around, crying and screaming, and a little girl pointing at the water. You drop your equipment, you kick off your shoes, and you jump in the water, and you fight to the bottom, and what you see there almost causes you to lose your air. But you don't surface, you instead reach out and you pick up the lifeless body and you swim to the surface and you put the body on the concrete and then you pull yourself out of the water and, into, and onto the concrete and you make a standing position. And the children are screaming, they're crying and they're pointing. What would you do? Well, you would drop down and do CPR, wouldn't you, if you were trained? But what if the body lying there is not a child? It's an iguana. Yeah. Bobo, the iguana, the pet, has drowned. And all the children who love Bobo are upset. 
Well, the paramedic said, well, he had heard that CPR had been done on dogs and cats, so why not an ugly iguana? Yeah. So he picks the iguana up into his arms. He puts his mouth over the iguana's mouth and nose and begins to resuscitate. In about a minute, the iguana comes to life and begins to twitch. And all the children begin to squeal. And the little girl who owned Bobo is ecstatic. And she grabs Bobo and hugs Bobo. Well, a reporter got wind of this and interviewed Officer Matthews. And he said, well, you know, kissing an iguana does seem kind of nasty. And now that I think about it, uh, an iguana is a pretty ugly cr creature. The last thing, however, I wanted, that I wanted was to tell that little girl that her pet was dead because she loved Bobo so. So made the difference. So. The apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus these words. But God who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In other words, we were a bunch of iguanas. And God loved us enough to give us a holy kiss. It's his way of saying that God loved us so much that God was willing to pay the supreme price for our sins. When we were ugly and sleazy and, uh, and completely unworthy of God's heart, God chose to come to us. God chose to pay the bill. God loved us just enough to take time not to scold us, but to show us love in action. No, God loved us so much that God gave himself to us in a Jewish Galilean carpenter by the name of Jesus. Now, John shows us in his gospel two iguanas. One is Martha. I mean, one is the woman, a Samaritan woman caught at the well and this Samaritan is an outcast just because of her, of where she's from or where she lives. She's an outcast. But this Samaritan woman has uh, been divorced five times and now just living with someone. And Jesus meets her. She's at the deep center of the iguana pool in Galilee. That story, however, is for another Sunday. Today we're dealing with a different kind of iguana. Nicodemus is at the top of the social order of his day. He's admired. He's respected. He has done everything right. His chief aim in life is to do everything so right that he's going to be included in heaven. He's going to get to go to heaven. So he follows all the rules, does all the regulations. He dots the I's and crosses the T's. He has power. He has control. He has respect. And the people of his area honor him. But if Nicodemus didn't have a need, he would not have made that trip to Jesus that night. Yeah, he comes at night. Old Nick at night. Dick at night. He comes because he has a deep need. He's done all the right things. He said the right things. He wonders, though, if it is enough. Have I done everything necessary to get my soul into heaven? Or is there more? Is there more? 
You know, maybe as he got older and he started seeing not the black and white of life, but the gray areas of life as we get older, you know, he began to question some things. And he begins to, he starts not having as much security in, in the things that he's been doing and in the things he's been saying. And he hears about this young rabbinic. He hears the teachings. He hears about the miracles. And he wonders, does he have what's necessary to be in the kingdom? Does he have what's necessary to go to heaven? For some reason, that right direction for Nick was not as clear as it once was. You know, there are times when life gets a little stale, a little boring, a little empty. You know, when you do the same things over and over and over again, you go through the motions, but the inner motivation is just not there. It's just routine. It just becomes habit. You do it, but your heart's not in it. You do it and it really doesn't affect your soul or who you are or your character. You know, it happens to us in all aspects of life. You know, in our jobs, for example, we go through the motions in many ways. Uh, uh, you know, the parts just become so familiar that we can almost do them as, like rote knowledge. We don't even think about it. You know, it's sort of like driving. You ever been driving along a road and you say, how did I get here? How many traffic lights did I run? You know? How many cross streets did I come across? Did I get here? How did I get here? Yeah, we've all done that, and, and that's sort of the way we are in life sometimes. We've done things over and over and over so much, we don't even think about it anymore. Now, I, one of the worst things that could have ever happened to me is put me on an assembly line, you know, where I had to do the same thing over and over and over again. I would have gone bonkers, you know. I couldn't do it. I, I admire and respect anybody who can do that repetitive work. But sometimes we do things in life, not just work, but just life itself so much, it just becomes routine, and we just don't think about it anymore. Uh, you know, it can happen in school. You know, uh, for our children, they do things the same way. You send the same bologna sandwich, you know, they don't even taste it anymore, you know. Uh, they, they hear the same questions from the teacher and they don't hear that anymore or the same statements and they don't hear that anymore. And school itself just becomes boring and we know how that went when we were in college. It got real boring too, didn't it? Yeah, kind of got in way of the real stuff, like the social stuff. But you know, the same thing can happen in our marriages. You know, Gail and I will have been married 40 years this next week. I think it was us. I think it's good, don't you? I mean, <laughs> you know, 40 years this next week. But there's times when we, we're talking and she pretty well knows what I'm going to say next and I pretty well know what she's going to say next. And I know at this point in our life, after 40 years, if we get in an argument, she's going to win. <laughs> you know, we just know each other very well. But, you know, sometimes we just get in a routine with our marriages, too. We Remember when we were young and, and, and uh, new to each other, we were infatuated, and we really wanted to know what the other one was thinking, what the other one was doing, you know. And over time, it just kind of, that kind of infatuation just slips away from us. But, you know, the same thing can happen to us in our religious life. The routine... We come in those doors on Sunday morning out of habit, not expecting anything to really jerk us or bless us or turn us around. We're just here because it's what's expected of us. It's routine. It's habit. And that may be exactly where Nicodemus was. Things had come into being just Totally routine for him. So Nick and others heard about Jesus and became interested. Something new is coming over the horizon. Then when the reports came in on the miracles and the radical reinterpretations of things, they were interested. They wanted to know, maybe this carpenter is the one sent from God. 
Maybe this carpenter is the one that has the answer into the kingdom of God, into heaven itself. So in the cover of darkness, Nicodemus comes to Jesus seeking light. Isn't that strange? He comes in darkness seeking light to life. And then that remarkable conversation begins. Now we don't know how Nicodemus found Jesus. Was Jesus in, in the Motel 6 of Jerusalem? We don't know. We don't know where Jesus was. Did Nicodemus come and knock on the, a door and Jesus answer the door? Was Jesus just standing out by a campfire or sitting out there contemplating things? Or was he sitting high on a mountain thinking about things? We don't know. But Nicodemus finds Jesus and this remarkable conversation begins. And Nicodemus doesn't ask a question initially. He makes a statement. He says we, which means he's not representing just himself. He says we. We know you are from God because no one could be doing these things unless he was sent from God. And then Jesus starts turning that conversation and Jesus lets him know that he, the reason he can't see the things of the kingdom is because he's not in the kingdom. He's not been birthed into that kingdom yet or begotten into that kingdom yet. He's missing it. And Nicodemus is so literal. He can't, he can't get into that spiritual way of thinking or talking. He is extremely literal. And he says, oh, how can an old man go back to the womb and be reborn? Uh, Nicodemus reminds me of the man who goes to the doctor wanting to lose weight. And the doctor says to him, okay, you eat regular, regularly two days a week, and then you skip a day. And then go back to eating two days regularly and skip a day. You'll lose five pounds in a month. The man says, okay, I'll do that. So after a month, he goes back to the physician, and the physician weighs him, and he's lost 15 pounds. And the physician says, whoa, something's wrong here. You know, you're losing weight too quickly. Did you listen to everything I said? Yes, I did. Did you eat two days regularly and then skip a day? He said, yes. He said, were you full on those two days you ate? He said, absolutely. He said, the eating was not the problem. It was all that skipping I did on the third day. Same problem with Nicodemus. Old Nick at night is very literal. Jesus is speaking spiritually. And he can't get into his mind that Jesus is also using a different word. Jesus is saying begotten, which is different than birth. Birth comes from the mother. Begotten comes from the father. And Jesus uses the word begotten here. Begotten. Begotten of the Father. You don't choose to be born, do you? Do you choose to be born? No. The begotten is a gift from God. God comes to you. God comes to you as a matter of grace and love. But Nick couldn't get beyond that. Then Jesus gives what Martin Luther called the gospel in miniature. Jesus says something like, Nick, old friend, you've spent your life trying to reach some moral status, attain some moral achievement. You've worked yourself silly trying to get good enough to earn God's acceptance and get yourself into the kingdom of God. You don't earn salvation. Salvation comes to you as a gift. I will pay the price for it. Why would God do all this for you? Because God loves you and this world enough. If you will believe that, you will already have the kingdom. If not, then you're already doomed. Paul calls that the unearned gift. And we know that unearned gift by grace. Max Lucado, in his book, A, a Gentle Thunder, tells a beautiful story. Uh, uh, it, his friend took his family to Disneyland and they went to, I don't know much about Disney, but it was uh, the Cinderella Palace, whatever that is. And uh, the friend went down there with his family to Cinderella Palace, and he said it was, they were in this large room, 
And all these kids were in there abuzz. And they were, you know, nine years old and below. And they were just all churning about. And then entered into this room came Cinderella. And he said she was absolutely beautiful. White dress, pristine, perfectly typecast. Uh, he said she was a stunning, stunningly gorgeous young lady. Every hair was in place. Her complexion was perfectly flawless. He, her blue eyes just danced and sparkled like glass. And then she, he said she just moved with deliberate grace into the room. And she looked so soft like she was just walking on air. And the children were just squealing as she came through. And the friend turned and noticed two children on the other side of the room. And he said it was really strange because all the children had run to the Cinderella side of the room. And he said if it had been a ship, it would have capsized. But on the other side was a mom and, and dad and two boys. One boy about 12 and the other boy about 7 or 8. And the seven or eight year old child was holding on to his brother's arm and leaning up against him like this. And as the friend paid closer attention to those two boys, he noticed the youngest one had been severely burned. And his face looked like plastic. He was so deformed. And he said, you know, probably at that moment, the thing that that child wanted more so than anything else was to be able to go over there and be with Cinderella. But, you know, he'd been rejected so much and he'd heard the whispers and the points, the pointing and the screaming and the squealing at his appearance that he was afraid of going over there and being with Cinderella. But then the miracle took place. The miracle, the real miracle took place. Cinderella saw him. And she began to move through the crowd of the squealing children, lightly brushing off their hands that were holding on to her dress. And she moved across the room to where the little boy stood. And she slowly knelt on her knees. And then she took the child by the face and leaned over and kissed him on the forehead. When Cinderella went to stand, this little iguana reached up and grabbed Cinderella around the neck and said, I love you so. I love you so. And that's what John is telling us in this story. That's what Jesus was telling Nicodemus. Cinderella comes to us. God comes to us. As ugly as we are, as contrived and lost and sinful as we are, God crosses the room to us. We don't have to cross the room. God comes to us. And then the second miracle takes place when, when we receive the resuscitation from God. And God's own spirit is breathed into us. We're begotten from the holy. Then the second miracle takes place. We begin living out the Christ in our life. Not because we're trying to earn anything, trying to get anything, or be anything except being an example of Jesus Christ. We're doing it because we love God so. Born of water, begotten of the Spirit, two births, a birth of water, a birth of spirit. That's what it means to be reborn, begotten of God. Now, if you've come to that point in your life where you say, God, I'm going through the motions, but I don't have that inner motivation any longer. I have the patterns of religion, but I don't have the power of it any longer. I have the rituals of faith, but not the real thing. I have the structure of faith, but I don't have the spirit of faith. If you come to that point in your relationship with God, whether you're 15, 25, or 96, 
and you sense that something's wrong with your life, one night you may come to the home of Jesus and knock on the door and say, Jesus, things aren't quite right anymore. Things aren't right in my heart. And Jesus is going to say to us the same thing he said to Nicodemus. I know. I know. You've been doing all the right things for all the wrong reasons. You need to be born of the water and born of the Spirit. Now, John Wesley, our founder, used to meet people and one of his stock questions. Now, he asked it because he really wanted to know, but he asked just about everyone he met that he didn't know. He would say, how is your soul? How is your soul? And I wonder if the holy were to ask us today how our soul is, how we would respond. The nature of our soul is important to God. How do I know? Because God loved us so. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, there are many things that stand between us and the life you intend for us to lead. Like frozen ground holding back a bulb's expression of life. These things subdue our spirits. So we ask that you break through. That you resuscitate us. That you... Make us begotten from the heavenly places. And that as we, after we have been begotten, we may show you in how we live our lives just how much we love you so. For we ask it in the name of your Son and for his sake. Amen.